Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for this day that you've given us, and we thank you for this place that you've provided for us to meet. Lord, I thank you for this group of believers, these brothers and sisters, these friends, Lord, the way you've knit this body together, and Lord, we come here this morning to celebrate you. And so, Lord, we worship you in song. We make note of what you're doing in our lives. We ask you for even more, Lord. And then we turn to your word. And so, Lord, as we turn to your word this morning, Lord, I ask that our ears would be open and our hearts would be ready, that our minds would be just prepared, Lord, to receive from you. And so, Lord, I know your spirit has a work to do in our midst this morning, and I ask that we would be those that would yield to that power, and we would turn over ourselves to you, and we would allow you to work, to penetrate us with your word, to motivate us, to change us, Lord, to build us up. And so we give you this time, and we just thank you in advance, and we do so in Jesus' name. Amen. Turn to Acts chapter 15. We made it through verse 21 of 15 last week. And we spent a lot of time just talking about this meeting that took place in Jerusalem, the council of leaders there that met to determine the course of action in their efforts to lead the Gentile world into a faith in Jesus as Messiah. And we saw the complications of that because some determined that these Gentile believers, in essence, had to become Jewish because before they could become believers in the Messiah and receive that salvation. We spent a lot of time on that and what it meant to be under the law or not under the law and how grace fits into all that. And if you weren't here last week, I'd encourage you to maybe go back and listen to it because its implications were far greater than just leading us into the next part of the story. But they finished with that meeting, and as we're going to see as we begin this morning, they decide to send ambassadors with their decision now to the places um, that the other men had gone and taught what was wrong. And uh, they end up sending a letter to them to tell of their decision. And so that's kind of where we come into the story this morning. Look at verse 22. Then it pleased the apostles and elders with the whole church to send chosen men of their own company to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas, namely Judas, who was also named Barsabbas, and Silas, leading men among the brethren. Now I'd start off by saying that we need to give some credit to these certain men that were talked about in verse 1 of this chapter. Mainly they were the Pharisees that had become believers in Jesus as Messiah. And I want to give them credit because they were willing to listen and they were willing to be convinced by the evidence of Scripture and by the confirmation of the Holy Spirit that the things that they had brought to the Gentiles, their instruction to them was wrong. And it's even more admirable in the way that they were willing to be taught and corrected. Because the truth is, it's a precious thing to have a teachable spirit. And it's something that we should all pray that we could say about ourselves, is that we're teachable. Sometimes I like to use the word coachable. I think the Holy Spirit coaches us. I believe he teaches us. But we have to be willing participants in that. We have to be willing to be taught. We have to be willing to be coached, which really needs a humbling beginning into saying, I don't know it all right now. And I might not know all that I need to know to go the distance that the Lord has asked of me. So following the council's decision, they sent Paul and Barnabas with two members of their own community, and they were probably Jewish Christians that were being sent with them, and they were sending them back to Antioch, the place where this whole dispute began. And really, the Jerusalem council exercised wisdom here in sending two from their own community, because that would fortify and personalize the message, because they're coming from the place that the original bad message had come from. Let's pick up in verse 23. Then they wrote the letter by them, and this is a kind of an abbreviated accounting of the letter, the apostles, the elders, and the brethren 
to the brethren who are of the Gentiles in Antioch, Syria, Sicilia, greetings. Since we have heard that some who went out from us have troubled you with words, unsettling your souls, saying you must be circumcised and keep the law, to whom we gave no such commandment, it seemed good to us, being assembled with one accord, to send chosen men to you with our beloved Barnabas and Paul, men who have risked their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We have therefore sent Judas and Silas, who will also report the same things by word of mouth. For it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things, to abstain from things offered to idols, from blood, from things strangled, and from sexual immorality. If you keep yourselves from these, you will do well. Farewell. Now notice that the false brethren who went from Jerusalem to Antioch originally had never received authorization or approval of the church in Jerusalem to take their message. So they worked completely autonomous. They went out and delivered this message that they must be circumcised, they must follow the Jewish ways. And here James voiced the decision of the council. But notice that the unity behind the decision was one of several evidences that it was the work of the Holy Spirit that sent them. You know, I've said before, and I'll say again, that if I were given permission to rename this book, I would rename it from the Acts of the Apostles to the Acts of the Holy Spirit. Because the reason these men were able to do what they did in almost all cases, or to not do what they wanted to do in some cases, was by the influence by the leading of the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit spoke through James and confirmed the message through others. And they could testify that the decision was made in cooperation with the Holy Spirit. It says there, it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us. I don't know about you, but those words make me smile. I mean, take note how confidently they treat the Holy Spirit as if he's one in their midst, as if he's a member of their group. They listen for his conclusion, as though he sits with them, sits with them as they deliberate, as they discuss. What a beautiful picture for us. What a great encouragement for us. You know, I was thinking back to our Passover Seder. Many of you were there. And at the Passover Seder, I explained to you that each of your tables had a chair that was not to be sat in by any of you, that that chair was a symbolic opening and invitation to Elijah. And I'm not going to go back through the whole teaching of what that's all about, but Elijah was to precede the Lord. He's to precede him again, if our scripture says, for his second coming as well. We won't go there right now. But it just with that picture, I think about how every one of our and I mean it metaphorically, tables should have an open chair for the Holy Spirit. Every conversation we have, every decision we make, every time we come together as brothers, as sisters in the Lord, as we come together as a church, as the leadership of this church meets, that there would always be an open seat to the Holy Spirit to make sure that he speaks, that we're listening to his direction. I mean, God sent him for that purpose, that we would not be left orphans, Jesus promised us, that he would lead and guide us and always point us to Jesus, always remind us. And so why wouldn't we always want him involved? I think I said last week that probably one of the most neglected, and I hate to say things, in the church, the most neglected person in the church, in most churches, is the Holy Spirit. And he's there for all the purposes, all the needs that we have. And so it's really on us to change that. Verse 30, so when they were sent off, they came to Antioch. And when they had gathered the multitude together, they delivered the letter. When they had read it, they rejoiced over its encouragement. So this letter proves itself to be a great encouragement to those that were there. I would imagine it should be. These Gentile disciples now knew that God did not save them through them becoming Jewish, but he saved them as Gentiles. What a relief. What a relief to see that the principle of grace had been preserved and applied to them. 
because they could have been those that would have forced the law. And those men that went down there at first to teach him did force the law. At least that was their desire. But grace overrode that. And again, as we spoke about last week, not that the law is any less important than it ever was. But in this time of grace, this dispensation of grace that we live in, it's a different approach that we have, a different covenant that we have with the throne as we approach it. Paul wrote about this in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9. He said, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. We're saved by grace. Our faith, which again is a gift, just the fact that he called us, that he pursued us, that he wooed us to him by his Spirit, It's a gift that we're even invited. What they heard that day that this letter came is that they were saved and they were right with God after all. Because they probably had some questions. Because if we are following the law as your means of salvation, then you will always have questions. Am I doing enough? Am I doing good enough? Do I need to repeat? I mean, we play that game with ourselves. Even those of us that understand that that salvation comes by faith and faith alone, we still get wrapped up in that lawful thinking. We sometimes get legalistic with ourselves because we look at God wrongly as a father. And sometimes we compare that heavenly father with our earthly fathers. And we wonder sometimes about all the struggle that we have to please him, to live up to what he's thinking, that maybe we're going to get punished for our shortcomings. And that's where we really need to make grace a lifetime study to really understand just how beautiful that is, how much he loves us, and how his mercies are really new every day. It's something to be thankful for. Look at verse 32. Now Judas and Silas themselves being prophets also exhorted and strengthened the brethren with many words. And after they had stayed there for a time, they were sent back with greetings from the brethren to the apostles. However, it seemed good to Silas to remain there. Paul and Barnabas also remained in Antioch, teaching and preaching the word of the Lord with many others also. So Judas and Silas remained for some ministry meetings during which they exhorted and built up the brethren in the faith. And after a prolonged time of joyful fellowship and the service in Antioch, they went back to Jerusalem. And they were told that Paul and Barnabas stayed in Antioch this time, and they taught and they preached the word. Probably now people were even more open to hear it because that lawfulness, that burden had been taken off, and there was a freedom in just hearing what the Lord had to say and what he might have wanted from them. Look at verse 36. Then after some days, Paul said to Barnabas, let us now go back and visit our brethren in every city where we have preached the word of the Lord and see how they are doing. Now Barnabas was determined to take with them John, called Mark. But Paul insisted they should not take with them the one who had departed from them in Pamphylia and had not gone with them to the work. Then the contention became so sharp that they parted from one another. And so Barnabas took Mark and sailed to Cyprus. But Paul chose Silas and departed, being commended by the brethren to the grace of God. And he went through Caesarea and Sicilia, strengthening the churches. So we discover these men are human after all. Now, where we're at right now is we've arrived at the beginning of the second missionary journey. And Paul broached the subject with Barnabas, and he suggested they revisit the cities that they had previously preached the word to. And we see here that Barnabas insisted that his nephew, John Mark, the writer of the Gospel of Mark, accompany them, and Paul strongly opposed the plan. You remember that Mark had turned away from them earlier. And Paul remembered vividly how Mark had departed from them. And he likely feared that he would do it again. So this contention between Barnabas and Paul, it says, became so sharp that they parted from one another. And Barnabas takes Mark, he goes to Cyprus, the place of his birth, and also the first stop that was on the first missionary journey. 
Paul chooses Silas, and he goes through Syria and Cilicia, Cilicia, excuse me, strengthening the churches. And I want us to notice here in verse 36 and verse 41, you just see this true pastoral spirit that Paul had. That he cared so much for the people that he had preached to, those that had received the word, that he wanted to go back and see how they were doing. Follow-up is always something I think important with the Lord. He lovingly cared for the people. He wanted to further disciple them and feed them. So at this point, there's a question that inevitably comes up. Who was right? Paul or Barnabas in the dispute that they had? My, my position is that there was probably fault on both sides. Perhaps Barnabas allowed his judgment to be swayed by his natural affection for Mark. He was a relative. Verse 39 shows that the contention between Paul and Barnabas was sharp, strong word. But you know, when I consider the words of Proverbs 13.10, it says, by pride comes nothing but strife. And so with that word in mind, I think you could say both leave, or both were likely guilty of pride in the matter. They held on to their own positions. One wouldn't yield to the other. They really, by our account, didn't even discuss it very deeply. But those who think Paul was right point out that Barnabas disappears from the story at this point, as if God wrote him out of the story as well. I don't believe that. Also, Paul and Silas were commended by the brethren to the grace of God, we read. But this is not said in the case of Barnabas and John Mark. In any event, it is heartening to remember that Mark finally did end up in favor, didn't he? Because later he completely was completely restored in the confidence of Paul, and we even have one of our four Gospels written by him. But you know, the lesson here, I think, for all of us, as you look at this story, consider something that may have happened in your own life with another believer. In the words of Paul, again, in Romans, and maybe he wrote this thinking of this exact event, but in Romans 12, verse 18, he says, if it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. And I've said many times from this pulpit that I think that's so important in the days that we live. That we really need to clean up all those broken relationships as much as depends on you. And I've been there. I know how hard it can be to try to fix a relationship. And you've gone every distance you can imagine to fix it from your side. And the other person won't yield. The other person won't meet you halfway. I get that. But as much as depends on you, I believe that's what the Lord would ask you to do to fix those relationships, because time is short. I believe that. Look at the first verse of chapter 16. Then he came to Derby and Lystra, and behold, a certain disciple was there named Timothy, the son of a certain Jewish woman who believed, but his father was Greek. He was well spoken of by the brethren who were at Lystra and Iconium. So I would think that strong memories must have come back to Paul when he returns to these places. Because remember, Paul was stoned possibly to death at Lystra. Now, for most people, that memory would have raised, I think, misgivings about ever returning there again. But what we see here, I believe, in the heart of Paul is it wasn't about his personal safety. Paul knew that God had people there. And no consideration for his own well-being could deter him. I think that's an interesting perspective. Wherever we end up, God probably has people there. You know, God's probably doing a work there somehow. Paul knew that God had people there, so he was in order, because that was at work there, he was able to put away any thought about himself I think he was more curious to see what God was doing than really worry about anything that would happen to him. Now, as for Timothy, it's possible that he was converted through Paul's ministry during the apostles' first visit to that location. Timothy's mother, we read about here, and his grandmother were both Jewish believers, but we're told that his father was Greek, and some commentators 
assume that he could have died by this time because he's not really mentioned the story. There's nothing to prove that. And Paul was pleased to learn from the brethren, their testimony there at Lister and Iconium, that Timothy was progressing well in the Christian faith. And I think these are the things that led Paul to have an affinity for Timothy and the relationship that built over the years. And so Paul invited Timothy to go along with him on this missionary trip. Now, something we should note is that the early apostles, they always traveled in pairs. But they also took younger brethren with them. And I think that's such a cool picture because it's a sign of something that's been lost in our time, which is discipleship. You know, and I I commend the men that I've seen, not that women aren't involved also in discipleship of other women, but I just think of the men that I've seen that have that affinity to grab a younger man and say, come with me, wherever they're going, just that they would walk with them and be able to teach and to feed into their lives. A lot about our modern life really deters us from that. You know, just the the way we live, the way our lives don't really cross. They're kind of just so specialized that it's hard to find that. I don't want to use that as an excuse, but I know there's much about this life compared to theirs that is so different. And I think they picked up that habit because in their culture, the Jewish culture, every rabbi had a following. Every rabbi would have a group of disciples that would move with them through their day, through their works, and they would learn from him. They would glean from him. Matter of fact, Jesus, as a Jewish man and as a rabbi, was modeling that very same thing as he went and took disciples. The difference is, in that culture, is that a rabbi would have young men come to him and say, could I be your disciple? Would you teach me? And they would agree or disagree. In the case of Jesus, he chose them. He chose them to come with them. And he modeled that life of discipleship everywhere he went. So there's certainly a precedent for it. And really think about the privilege for those young men to join together with these seasoned veterans in these Christian missions to see how they're doing these things. And it's even more interesting because they're kind of learning as they go too. It's not like they got all this experience in missions. Look at verse 3. Paul warned, excuse me, Paul wanted to have him go on with him. And he took him and circumcised him because of the Jews who were in that region. For they all knew that his father was Greek. Now this can raise some questions. Because before they departed, Paul circumcises Timothy. So one might ask, why would he do this when he had refused, if you read in Galatians chapter 2, to have Titus circumcised? And that would have been previous to this. And the answer is simply this. In the case of Titus, it was a question of fundamental Christian doctrine, whereas here it's not. False teachers were insisting that a full-blooded Gentile like Titus had to be circumcised in order to be saved, and they were wrong. Paul recognized this as a denial of the sufficiency of Jesus' atoning work, and he wouldn't allow it in the case of Titus. But here with Timothy, Timothy, the case is entirely different. The people of the area knew that Timothy was of Jewish heritage from his mother. So now Paul, Silas, and Timothy were going forth on this evangelistic work, and the first contacts, contacts that they would have would frequently be with Jews, with the Jewish men. And if these Jews knew that Timothy was not circumcised, they might refuse to listen. Whereas if he were, they would be no possibility of offense on this issue. So some of us could argue with it. It's recorded here in Scripture. It's what Paul did. I don't see him admonished for it. And yeah, I'm defending him. But in the end, we could say it's strongly implied that Paul circumcised Timothy just to gain an audience for the gospel with the Jews. And in a sense, Timothy became all things to all men that he might win the more which is an evaluation we have to make even when we look at a situation and think, well, I shouldn't have to do that. Well, sometimes we're called to do certain things in order to make the gospel go as far as it can. So I'm not going to argue and be (laughs) in favor or against. It's here, and it's what happened. 
in verse four. And as they went through the cities, they delivered to them the decrees to keep, which were determined by the apostles and elders at Jerusalem. So the churches were strengthened in the faith and increased in number daily. So these three missionaries go out, and as they travel through the cities, they deliver to the churches the decrees, which that letter that went spoke about, the decisions that they made in Jerusalem at that council. And remember those decrees, I'll just go through them again in brief, because they were making sure that everyone they came in contact with knew this. And the three things were, as far as salvation is concerned, it's about faith alone. Circumcision or law-keeping should not be added to faith as a condition of being saved. That's not why Paul did it with Timothy. He did it so that he could win the audiences. The second thing was sexual immorality was forbidden for all believers for all time. That was very particular and important for the Gentiles. Because remember, the Gentiles were pagans. They were those that had no faith in the real God, unlike the Jews. And because the Jews followed the laws the best they can, sexual immorality was something that was burned into them. And where in the Gentile, the pagan world, the sexual immorality would have just been an everyday thing. And then the third thing was meats offered to idols, meat from animals that had been strangled, and blood were forbidden as food. And again, not matters essential to salvation, but it was to facilitate fellowship with the Jewish and Gentile believers. Now, as time goes on, some of these things are changed a little bit in Scripture, in the New Testament. They're altered a bit. We won't make that our study this morning. So as a result of the ministry of these men, the churches were strengthened in the Christian faith, and they increased in number daily. And let's consider Timothy again. He played an important part over the years in the expansion and the strengthening of the churches, and he really kind of had a hard lot because Paul very often made him the ambassador to troubled spots. And so he, he earned his wings rather early and in some tough ways, And Timothy goes on to become the pastor of the church at Ephesus, which was an incredibly important and incredibly difficult place to do ministry. And he probably joined with Paul in Rome right before Paul, shortly at least before Paul was martyred. And remember, Paul saw Timothy kind of as his spiritual son um, in the way that he treated him. Look at verse 6. Now, when they had gone through Phrygia, In the region of Galatia, they were forbidden by the Holy Spirit to preach the word in Asia. After they had come to Mycenae, they tried to go to Bithynia, but the Spirit did not permit them. So passing passing by Mycenae, they came to Tros. So after strengthening the churches in the region, Paul sought to go next in a southwest direction towards the important city of Ephesus we just talked about. But look at that. Paul was forbidden by the Holy Spirit to go there. And it's interesting the Holy Spirit would actually stop Paul from doing something that we would normally think of as good, and that would be preaching God's word to all that needed it. But the Spirit of God is all-knowing, and he directed this work of Paul's. Paul just wasn't the right person at the right place at the right time to begin bringing the gospel to the Roman province of Asia Minor. Now, there was nothing wrong with Paul's desire to do that, to preach the word in Asia, but it wasn't God's timing. So it was forbidden by the Holy Spirit. Now, one of the things we don't get here is how exactly the Holy Spirit said no to Paul. It may have been through a word of prophecy or by an inward speaking of the Holy Spirit, or it could have been by the circumstances that it was surrounded by. But whatever means it was done, Paul and his companions got the message. Ephesus would come later, not now. And we read there, they tried to go to Bithynia, but the Spirit did not permit them. So after an attempt to go to Asia, Paul sought to go north into Bithynia, but he was again prevented by the Holy Spirit. So it tells us he came to Tros. Now, I want us to notice this. Paul was guided by hindrance. It's really important for us to see. 
Because sometimes I think we have the thought that if I'm guided somewhere by God, it's one open door after another. How many times do we pray, God, open a door for me? And yet God shuts doors as well. He shuts doors to prevent us from doing something, maybe not bad, but less important than what he wants us to do. Because he sees all. And so we really need to interpret that in our own lives correctly, as best we can discern. And not get frustrated as often as we do, and I say we because I know the feeling of being stopped from doing something. Of thinking that your intentions were so great, that you're so prepared, that how could this not be what God has for you or I? And yet the door closes. Or some circumstance prevents us from going there. And we may immediately, in our mind, blame that either on the circumstance or on ourselves by some means not being prepared enough or willing or, or um, worthy enough. Or maybe we'll immediately blame it on the devil. So we need to have discernment because it could be the devil. And it may be us. But how many times do we overlook the fact that this just may be the work of God? That he's prevented me from going down this so that something better comes. Or maybe because it's not the timing and that'll come, but not now. And so we really need to remain prayerful and we need to be praying for that discernment that we would know. Look at verse nine. And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia stood and pleaded with him saying, come over to Macedonia and help us. Now, after he had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go to Macedonia, concluding that the Lord had called upon us to preach the gospel to them. So in Trous, God made Paul's direction clear. He gets this vision. And in the vision, he's invited to the region of Macedonia. So that's westward across the Aegean Sea. And this moved Paul and his missionary team from the continent of Asia to the continent of Europe. So this was the first missionary endeavor into Europe. So the wisdom and greatness of God's plan was beginning to unfold. In Paul's mind, he wanted to reach a few cities in that region where he was at. But listen, God wanted Paul to reach a whole continent, to win a whole continent for Jesus. And I think in that is the encouragement to not put God in a box. To not think too small when we think about what opportunities might await us. To not judge for ourselves the size of something and therefore its worthiness when we really don't know how God sees it and we don't really know exactly what he's doing. And the truth is, with all the right thoughts in our heart, with the right condition of heart, with all the right motivations, we might want to do this. And yet, in the economy of God, that may seem so small compared to what he's got for us. So don't put God in a box. Don't think too small when you consider what he may be doing. Now, I want you to note something, and maybe some of you caught it in verse 10. There's a significant change in the personal pronoun. It goes from he to we. Now, it's generally believed, and I believe it, that at this point, Luke, who's the writer of Acts, joins Paul and Silas and Timothy on their missionary journey. And from that point forward, it becomes a first person telling as opposed to second person, as it was being written. So he records the events going forward as an eyewitness. Look at verse 11. Therefore, sailing from Tros, we ran a straight course to Samothrace, and next day came to Neapolis, and from there to Philippi, which is the foremost city of that part of Macedonia, a colony. And we were staying in that city for some days. So here, Paul and his missionary team, now including Luke, had to sail across the Aegean Sea from the continent of Asia to the continent of Europe. And that was a big step. It's perhaps a bigger than Paul even knew. But it's interesting to note one thing here that I want to point out. 
It says they sailed straight from Samothrace. Well, if you were to look in the wording in Greek here, it's quite revealing because it includes a nautical expression that means the winds were at their back. That means the winds were so perfect that they actually sailed 156 miles in two days. Whereas the return trip in the, same, in the opposite direction, which we'll read about in Acts chapter 20, took them five days. And I think it's significant. I think it's significant because the Lord was with them, behind them, in a sense, sending them. And I love the fact that what moved that ship? The winds. The perfect straight winds moved that ship. And we're concentrating this morning, I hope you along with me, on the works of the Holy Spirit here in the lives of these apostles and these disciples. And when you think of the Holy Spirit, you think of his name. Spirit in the Greek is pneuma, from which we get our English word pneumatic. It speaks of air. It speaks of breath. And really that's the picture that we have of the Holy Spirit being the breath of God, being that wind that sets our sails. And then in the Hebrew, it's ruach, which means the same thing, breath, wind. And so you just get this beautiful picture that he was in that work, sending them quickly to that place that he wanted to send them. No matter how great the heart of Paul was and his tensions were for the things he wanted to do locally, there was a big work awaiting them, the whole continent of Europe. Look at verse 13. And on the Sabbath day, they went out of the city to the riverside where prayer was customarily made and we sat down and spoke to the women who met there. Now a certain woman named Lydia heard us. She was a seller of purple from the city of Thyatira who worshiped God. The Lord opened her heart to heed the things spoken by Paul. And when she and her household were baptized, she begged us saying, if you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. So she persuaded us. So apparently we can gather from this picture of the women on the riverside on the Sabbath worshiping that there was probably, most likely, almost certainly, no synagogue in Philippi. But Paul and his companions heard that some Jewish people, possibly converts, gathered on the Sabbath outside the city by the riverside. And the fact that the Jews of Philippi had no synagogue and met by the river means that there were not many Jewish men in Philippi. How do I know that? Because tradition was and still is that you can have no religious ceremony in the Jewish tradition unless you have what's called a minion of Jewish men. A minion simply meaning counting or the number 10. And there's different scriptural explanations that are kind of loose is how they came up with that tradition. I'm not going to take us through that, but it was very prominent. It still is prominent today that there must be 10 Jewish men in the pre- in, in present. It's like a quorum, having a quorum, and the number is 10. If they have nine, you don't go nowhere. You don't do it. And I've told you the story before that I just, I remember being a, a kid and not yet 13, a Jewish kid not yet 13, I hadn't been bar mitzvahed yet. So it wasn't until I was bar mitzvahed that I could be counted as a man and be one of the 10. And I can remember two incidents clearly in, my, in that age time of my life where I was somewhere, and, they were, and I don't remember what they were waiting to do. One of them was a memorial, but they were waiting for the 10th man. And I remember just being a frustrated little Jewish kid because I wanted to be the 10th man. And, you know, it's something interesting about that. They have nine. Nine's a lot of guys. And yet how special is it for that man to come and be the 10th, to complete what God has asked them to do? This has always led me to another thought that I've had over my life as a Christian studying the Scripture. And I can't prove I'm right in this but it's my strong opinion 
when I think about how many things that Jesus came and taught to the Jews that adjusted what they believed, just like in his Sermon on the Mount and the Beatitudes, how many times did he say, but I say? You've heard, but I say. Well, I think one of the things he said is that wherever there be two or three, I'll be in their midst. And I think that was a watering down or a canceling out or a pushing to the side of this very thing. I think he was letting them know, you don't need 10. I mean, you just need two or three. Now, of course, we're one who is a believer. The Lord is with them. But I think that was, because that that expression sort of gets kind of complicated. Well, why is it one or two enough? Why is it two or three? I think he was just cutting it down for them. Look, guys, you don't have to wait for all 10. I mean, two or three is good. I'll be in your midst even there. And I think, personally, that that's what he was addressing. Can't prove it. So they reached this spot, and they found a group of women praying, including this one woman named Lydia. Originally from the city of Thyatira in the district of Lydia, interesting, in Western Asia Minor, she had moved to Philippi, and it tells us that she was a seller of, of purple dyed cloth. Now, Thyatira was famous for its dyes. Thyatira is interesting because it's one of the seven churches in Revelation 2 and 3 that Jesus addresses. But anyone who was a seller of purple was dealing with a very valuable, luxurious product, which means Lydia was probably, by those standards of the day, wealthy. Because the dyes were used for making purple the dyes used for making purple were expensive and they were very highly regarded. It's why it's the color of royalty because it was so hard to get. Now this woman, we could glean from what we read here, was the first convert in Europe. And Lydia was not saved by good works, but she was saved in order to do them. And immediately upon her saving, she just asked, if I'm, you found me worthy in my faith, please come. Stay with me in my house. And as Luke relays, they did. So some thoughts just to kind of sum things up this morning. You know, in order to function effectively on earth, the early church depended on the guidance of its head in heaven. Now, I believe the reason they were so good at that is they were closer to the beginning. Their primary reference was the Spirit because the Spirit gave birth to the church on that day of Pentecost. So they were closer to its origin. They really didn't have a history to start to water that down. It was their reference. The Holy Spirit gave birth to the church And he must be the one, by the instruction of Jesus himself, that's going to lead us and guide us into all righteousness. Now, how did Jesus make known his will for his servants? Well, he had left them his general strategy. He left it with them before he ascended. Remember in Acts chapter 1, he said, You shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem in all Judea and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. After his ascension, he had made known his direct and specific will to them in several ways. And he did it always through the Holy Spirit. And how did he do that? Let's look. There was five ways that I could record. He made known his direct and specific will through the scriptures, through visions and prophecies, through circumstances, through the advice and initiative of other Christians, and through direct communication. Now, it's possibly like an inward, subject, subjective manner. Some of you know that last one I just mentioned. You know when the Spirit is spoken. It may not have been an audible voice, but you're sensitive, and maybe not always, but sensitive to the Spirit wanting you to do something or correcting you from doing something. That doesn't really come without a sensitivity. 
And that sensitivity isn't necessarily a gift from God, although it is a gift, but not so specific that everyone can't have it. Because as a believer, I'm telling you, every one of you has it. You have that sensitivity if you'll open yourself to it, to hear the Spirit speak. And when you start there, then these other four, Scripture, visions and prophecies, circumstances, and advice and initiative of other Christians, become all the more rich. Because if I'm listening for the Spirit to speak to me directly, I'm going to hear Him when He speaks to me through the Word. I'm going to recognize Him when I get a vision about something He wants me to do. I'm going to see Him in my circumstances. And I'm going to know that it's He that's directing me, either by open or closed doors. And if I get advice from another believer, a fellow brother or sister, I'm going to be able to say, my spirit confirms that or not. And so we have the problem of being 2,000 years from the birth of the church. Our reference isn't as fresh as theirs to the birth of the church. Our reference isn't as fresh as theirs to being led by the Spirit. Our reference is the Christian life we came up in, the churches that we attended, the way that we were taught, the history of our interactions with the Spirit or not. And so we're asking the Lord for an open, new, refreshing, pure vision for what the Spirit is, what He does, and how I'm supposed to live with Him in my life, depending on Him for everything. Knowing that He will lead me, He will guide me, He will speak to me. If I believe He's there, if I believe that's what He does, and if I ask. Because we have a whole lot of life behind us that is our reference. Maybe you've been a Christian for 10 years. What's your reference to the Holy Spirit? It's that whole 10 years. Maybe you've been walking with the Lord 30, 40, 50 years. Maybe 60, 70 years. Your reference to him is those years. What I want to encourage is to look all the way back, all the way back to the dependency and the seamless experience relationship they had with the Holy Spirit and encourage all of us that this is the way it's supposed to be. And that's the way it can be. But we have to believe that. We can't just say, well, that was for them. Or even use the ex- what I just told you as an excuse. Yeah, well, they were so close to the origin of. The Holy Spirit's no further from us than he was from them. Which means he's as close to us as he was to them. But we need to believe that. We need to believe that. You know, Proverbs chapter 20, verse 24 says, A man's steps are of the Lord. And then it it comes with a question, How then can a man understand his own way? Wow. I don't know about you, but that verse tells me that I waste a lot of time. Because if the Lord orders my steps because I'm his child, I mean, if I truly believe that, not just once in a while, but always, even if I just believe that's his desire at least, because he has a better plan than mine, then I have to deal with that question, how can I understand my own way? It's a good question. How much better would things go if we did it his way? You know, I'm going to say something, that, a pretty strong statement. I'm going to re- read it to you the way I wrote it down. If the only reference you have to your Christian life is your history as a Christian, then it's very possible that you have made an idol of that history and are ignoring the present dynamic and ongoing work of the Holy Spirit in your life. I'm going to read that again. If the only reference you have to your Christian life is your history as a Christian, 
then it's very possible that you've made an idol of that history and are ignoring the present dynamic and ongoing work of the Holy Spirit in your life. When you and I as Christians come together and talk about God, and I'll tell you, the, the question that's, and I'm ashamed to say it, but I'm, I'm going to confess it, the questioning can quiet me immediately is when somebody comes up to me and says, so tell me what God's doing in your life. I get stuck. I know he's doing tons of things. But here's the, but, but I'd rather be stuck there looking at today or at least the very recent days to answer your question than have my only reverent reference be, well, once upon a time God did. I mean, if that's our only reference to Jesus is what he once did, a long time ago, and that's what we base everything today and forward on, then I just may be worshiping that event instead of him. It's a heavy message. It was heavy to me when the Lord gave it to me and I wrote it down. I believe our history can become an idol. And we get stuck there, worshiping what once was. When the fact is God's doing something new today. He's dynamic. He lives. He's alive in our life today and doing. He's alive in the life of the church and doing. He's alive in the world on the earth and doing. And so it's dynamic. I mean, all I can do is hope to keep up with him. And so I do want to encourage you with those words that you might sit before the Lord and say, what are you doing today, Lord, in my life? What's going on today? What's going on right now? Because I have such testimony, you have such testimony of the doors he's opened, of the doors he's closed, of the way he got you through, got you by, of the richness of whatever event and whatever time that you walked with him in your life. And all those are beautiful, wonderful, important, and don't ever lose them. But if that's our only reference, let today be your reference. Let the very precious now be your reference. We never get this back. We never get this back. I preach this to myself, and I have a hard time listening. The precious now. I mean, it's only here for a moment. The now I talked about just a moment ago is not now anymore. I mean, it's that fast. And the older I get, the faster I realize life is. And it doesn't get any slower. I've missed a lot of time just in earthly things. I've missed a whole bunch of time with the Lord because I'm kind of involved in earthly things. And I just think he's encouraging me, you, all of us this morning to just start figuring out who he is right now. Right now. Speak to him right now. Let him speak to you right now. Because I think that's what's going to make all the difference about a moment from now, about tomorrow. Yeah, I don't know how else to say it. But this was a wake-up call for me too. It's easy to look back, especially when you can't really look forward. You can look forward to things, but you can't look forward to anything with certainty. The only thing certain is right now. Right now. And I think we need to realize how precious now is. So we will rest there. On Wednesday nights, if you're not used to coming... I finish teaching and I ask for questions and comments. I don't do that on Sunday because there's too many of you. But I was just about to say it because I'm so used to saying it. I didn't say it, so don't say nothing. Ushers and worship. But if you're interested in that kind of exchange, Wednesday night's where you get it. Hint, hint. (laughs) 
Well, Father, we thank you. We thank you again for the day that you've given us. We thank you that your grace is so present, Lord, in our life. We thank you for the love that really was the reason, Lord, that you saved us because you loved us. And you continue to love us, Lord, in spite of ourselves. We thank you for those mercies, oh Lord, those mercies, new every day. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for one another. We thank you for you, Lord. And Lord, I ask that you would give each of us, Lord, a fresh dose of discernment about things in our lives, about in our th- in things in our dealings with you. Lord, I pray that we would make this precious now, the moment that we live with you, that we would see that every step, every breath is yours, that every moment by moment is a path that you've set that you want to walk with us. So Lord, I, with everyone here, Lord, hold on to the precious things you did in our past, all the ways that we interacted with you, all the ways that you saved us and preserved us, all the miracles that you've performed, both known and unknown. And Lord, we want to celebrate those things, testify those things, but not worship the past. We want to worship you. And so, Lord, I pray that you give each of us a a new and refreshed focus on you today, in this moment, and then moment by moment as we go. Thank you, Jesus.